All right. Um, I want to talk a bit about going beyond Andre Ort, our last two lectures, and what they would take, sort of what the missing ingredients are. So, So, so yeah, one issue that uh, one needs to generalize is the question of transcendence, which has sort of been done, and I want to discuss how Ax Lindemann, which did last week, sort of fits into this more general picture. Um, so just very briefly, the history of this transcendence business starts from number theory. People actually want a transcendence of numbers, complex numbers. Um, so there's a conjecture due to Shaniel very much to open which says the following it says If you have n numbers of 1 through alpha n in q bar, then these numbers are linearly independent over the rationals, then if you look at the transcendence degree just over q, Q will join these n numbers, so so far it could just, sorry, these, these numbers are in the complex. These are complex numbers. They don't have to be algebraic. Yes, yeah, so if you are drawing these n numbers, and then you also are drawing their exponentials, you always get at least n. Okay? Um, so a couple comments. First of all, you can obviously get exactly n. You can set one of alpha i and give the alpha i to be any other great number you want. And so that will give you something which is at most n. Um, also, you sort of clearly need the q linearly independent condition because if the sum of n i alpha i is zero, then the product of e to the alpha i to the n i is one, which means neither alpha i nor e to the alpha i is sort of adequate to the transcendence degree. So, to just peel those off. Okay, but beyond that, so sort of expect this inequality to be true. Yeah, it's very open, it's uh, independent. Um, It's, it's uh, very open and difficult, and sort of just uh, I always give this corollary of it. So if you look at n equals 2, you set alpha 1 to be 1, and alpha 2 to be i times pi. Then what it says is the transcendence degree of zero joining one, i pi, e to the one, which is e, e to the i pi, which is minus one. And one and minus one aren't doing very much at all. And so e and i pi must be algebraically independent. i is algebraic. So what this is saying is that e and pi are algebraically independent. Over Q. Over Q bar, Okay, which is very open. I think I think even like E plus pi is not now irrational or something. Um, yeah, it's very hard conjecture. 
um, one known result due to Lindemann in the case n equals one and generalized by Weierstrass in general is that this is true, Daniel's conjecture is true if n numbers are already algebraic. So if your n numbers are algebraic, then these guys don't have a trans degree at all either, because they're all algebraic over here. So in that case, just saying that they're exponential, algebraically independent. So for example, if you look at like e, e to the root 2, and e to the root 3, these are algebraically independent. Okay, there's a couple other sort of isolated results, but for the most part, ah, it's good. Okay, um, so that's the number theory picture. I want to switch to the function field setting. And so x in the 70s, decided to work instead of with the field C over Q, sort of doing number theory, or something more geometric. So he worked with a pair where you take C and you join formal power series in N variables. That becomes a field. That's an extension of C. So this is a ring, it's not a field, so you can look at the fraction field if you like. Uh, and you sort of treat that in relation to C the same way as you treat C in relation to Q. In case we're sort of interested about algebraic relations between things here and their exponentials over the complex numbers. Okay, so in this case, there's another um, phenomenon present, which is that you can, if you have power series here, you can let it ask about their uh, transcendence degrees, so algebraic relations, but their power series relations. Right? So, like, so for example, if um, F and G are inside this thing, we can ask if this is zero for some power series in two variables, Q1, for some sort of non-trivial power series in two variables. Okay, and if no such capital F exists, then obviously they're also algebraically independent because particularly you can't make up to be a polynomial. Okay. So, so how to think of this, um, another way to sort of think of it, a little more geometric, is if you take these guys, take say n functions in this, in this ring, and sort of assume they're convergent. Well, you don't have to be, but let's pretend they are for a second. So if they are, you can think of this as a map from C to the N to C to the M. And we can ask for the dimension of this image, right? So we can ask sort of. Y 
what is the dimension of the image of action? And that sort of tells us the answer to this question. It sort of tells us some sort of dimensional notion of these sets of X functions. So if there were actually convergence, uh, we can actually look at this image and actually ask this question, it's going to be some analytic set, so we'll get some sort of analytic variety, we can ask for its dimension. Um, one nice way to, to write that down is you can use sort of the implicit function theorem to say that the dimension of this image is equal to the rank of the matrix of partial derivatives. Right, it's generically smooth, and at a smooth point, this tells you the dimensional dependent space. Okay, the nice thing about this is you can just sort of write this down without any convergence. And this is some quantity, some number which is at most um, n and also at most n, as you sort of expect from this kind of description. And so when I say rank here, I sort of, you know, each one of these is an element of this ring, and so I just mean rank over that ring. Okay. Um, so in this context, X has the following theorem. Let me write it over here to this space. Suppose you have your um, M functions, and now we're going to insist, for similar reasons to before, that they're Q linearly independent over the complex numbers. So there's no Q linear combination of them which will give you just a complex number instead of a, one of these functions. Then if you look at the transcendence degree, so we see, of the field you get when you join all M of these functions. Sorry, N are exponential. Without exponentiate from all parts, right? everything converges fine and naively, and everything works out. So, you get at least m like before, but then you can do a little bit better because you get m on top of what you get for free, which is a dimensional motion. And this is sort of the the correct equality in this set. Okay? So again, um, you need a linear independence over C because we're doing things over C. And so if you have a clear relation of like F1 in terms of the rest, then F1 doesn't add anything, and even the F1 also doesn't add anything. I'm going to exponentiate means you can take those both out. And they also doesn't contribute anything to this rank, so everything stays unaffected. Um, so you need this guy here. And secondly, to get equality, what can you do? You can just take F1, Fi, um, equal Ti for some i less than k. So let's say i between 1 and k, and then fj to be algebraic 
over that field for J bigger than K at most F. Okay, so if we do this, and what is it saying? Well, this is saying that if you look at this image, you'll get some algebraic variety inside CUDM. So in particular, the transcendence degree of this set of functions is going to be exactly K, because clearly these guys are algebraically independent, and the rest of them aren't adding anything. They're algebraic over the previous guy by, by choice. So the first batch will give you this much transcendence degree, and then you're adding M functions, and so they can raise the transcendence degree by most M, most one per function. So you have to have equality in that case, assuming X -M. I'm not sort of proving that case. Okay, so then, sort of, um, after sort of PILA introduced a bunch of notation, did, did some work generalizing these results. So X is directly proved this result, which is called the X general theorem. But it became natural to separate a special case, which you can call actually the Manoir stress, as the analog of the Hunde Manoir stress theorem in the number field setting. So in that case, we had these, we were working over Q, and we had complex numbers, and we said if these guys are algebraic, then these guys are algebraically independent. So now there's no real notion of sort of algebraicity, um, but you can come close. You can sort of say they're algebraic given the sort of rank condition. So what this statement says is that if the if the, the dimension which we're writing as the rank of this matrix of partial derivatives is equal to the transcendence degree. these functions, i.e. if the image of this map is an algebraic variety, assuming it makes sense. And you have this Q-linear dependence condition, of stop writing, but you always need that. Then the exponentials are algebraically independent over the complex numbers. So basically, if I take any algebraic variety whose coordinate functions don't satisfy the independent relation, and I look at the coordinate functions, algebraic functions, and I exponentiate them, they're algebraically independent over that variety. Why do you need to get equality in that? Balance? I'm sorry? Does that kind of get equality in that? In this, in this case? Yeah. Yes, in this case, you have to get equality. So it's not just algebraic and over C, it's algebraic and over C, F1, F2, FN. That's right. So, sorry, so what I mean is that the action of the Weierstrass statement refers to this statement. Yeah. Uh, in fact, something stronger is true, which is these guys algebraically independent over the FIs. Okay. Um, you're sort of asking why do we have this? No. Oh, okay. I, I, I just wonder if it's true. Yeah, yeah, it is true. It is true. Mm -hmm. I'll explain in a minute why this. I mean, why this is what's called by the Manoir stress. that dealing with this sort of context um, allows you to deal with things like iterated exponentials and everything you can write down basically with exponentiation and algebraic operations. So like just note we can set like F2 
equals e to the f1, f3 equals e to the f2, and these are sort of algebraic relations on these functions. And so this gives lemma. This clearly implies f3 is e to the e to the f1. So x general can make statements about sort of functions and the iterative exponentials and algebraic varieties of those guys and then exponentials of those. So anything you can write down with, in some precise sense that I don't want to go into, anything you can write down with polynomial expressions and exponentiation you can sort of frame in this context. So somehow this ends up being the ultimate transcendence theorem in a precise sense for the exponential function. Um, okay. So, so X proved this theorem uh, basically using the differential equation for e to the x. I mean, differential e to the x, get e to the x, and then you have algebraic polynomial relations between these guys. You can differentiate and stuff happens. You get more relations. Um, the proof is quite difficult. That's not to say that this observation <laughs> proves this theorem immediately. Uh, it's quite difficult and clever, but um, he developed some like algebraic machinery using differential fields to sort of deal with this theorem. Um, so I want to explain now another way to look at it um, using geometry and varieties. Okay, so from now on, we are going to assume that the F1 through Fm are convergent. It turns out this is actually, there's a, a theorem which says that it's sufficient to assume this in order to prove theorems like this. Um, which might seem surprising at first, but it shouldn't really be that surprising because all we sort of care about in this kind of result is a differential field structure, right? We just care about the exponentiation, which, and what does that mean? All that means is if you allow differentiation, then e to the x is just something which solves the differential equation. That's sort of something you can write down algebraic unit derivations. And you care about algebraic relations. And convergence and divergence don't really relate to that. They're somehow totally separate concepts. Um, so there's a precise theorem, which I don't write down, uh, but it says that if you look at the field of convergent functions, the differential field, that's sort of big enough to encompass any finite set of functions. Kind of like how algebraic, if you prove something for the complex number, you prove it for any algebraic field field characteristic zero, because C is like a big enough field to accommodate any finite set of functions. The same thing is sort of true over here. Um, so this actually is a, it is not a big assumption, but it, it doesn't sort of matter. Um, okay, so assume these are convergent. This is the case we're going to end up hearing about anyways. So then, yeah, then we have a map from, let's say, the some disk, some m-dimensional disk, some small ball, into C to the n. So the dimension of this is the rank quantity over there. Um, and so note that if we look at this map, so, let, um, yeah, so if you look at the image, so if you look at, yeah, all right. The image of this disk. Yes, let me write this both down. So first of all, the dimension as an analytic variety is equal to this rank thing. This matrix of partial derivatives. But also the transcendence degree over C of these M functions is equal to what? Well, what this is asking for is how many independent algebraic relations are there between the FIs. In other words, it's asking for the dimension of the smallest algebraic variety containing this image. Because an algebraic variety containing this image is exactly spell out polynomial relations on the coordinates, which exactly gives you relations between these guys. So in fact, this transcendence degree is equal to the dimension 
not of the image, but of its diversity closure. Okay? So we can capture this kind of algebraic expression in geometric language like this. Because we haven't really done it, we're just rephrasing the statement to just sort of make things look more geometric. Okay, so we want the Fs and their exponentials. So we can just do that. We can map our disk into C to the N cross C star of the N by looking at the functions in the C to the N. And then the exponentials in the C star of the N. Because we're diagonal embedding. Now we'll let U be the image of this map. So this map of the M. Yeah. So you use some analytic variety. And just by the nature of its construction, U is inside the graph of the exponential function. Okay, and now what does X tell you? Assuming some Q leader independence, is the dimension, the Zariski closure of this, is at least um, the, the sort of rank quantity, which we saw is the dimension of U itself, plus Sorry? Maybe it's just M. It's possible. Um, oh, because I had M functions before? Okay. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. So, oh, right. So, yeah, M functions, yes. Let me unswitch them. Sorry, you guys should do whatever is most comfortable in your notes. Let me make this correct, though. Um, but we have M functions and M variables. This is right. This is right now. This is N. This is M. This is M. This is N. And these two are M. Okay. This is what we get. Okay, which is a purely sort of geometric statement now about guys inside. Uh, this graph. So you can reformulate X purely in this language. Let me reformulate it one more time. So so now we're starting here with sub varieties, holomorphic sub varieties of this graph. And taking the risky closure, we can extend switches around and start the risky closure and intersect with this graph. And I'm getting an equivalent statement. Again, starting from V, okay, and this is the formulation that's usually taken nowadays. So, what you do. is that V is some algebraic variety inside the product of C to the N and C star to the N. You let U be a component of the intersection of V with the graph of the exponential function.
And now, X says the following. He says, assume that there are no collinear relations. And the way to express that is saying you project U to business unit EM coordinates, then this is, is not contained. You may proper. Q linear subspace coset. We're allowed to translate by arbitrary complex numbers, but the coefficients have to be rational as before. So then the dimension of V is at least the dimension of U plus M. But that's the same. But the V continues as the closure of view, so it's even bigger. Okay, but this means the dimension of V is at least M, and now if you intersect any two holomorphic varieties, the intersection is of co-dimension at least, at most, the sum of their co-dimensions. So in fact, if this is true, then by pure sort of nonsense of intersection theory, the dimension of V has to equal the dimension of equal Because the other inequality is always true. That's how intersection works. So, so, right. But co-dimension U is always at most co-dimension V plus co-dimension of the graph, which is N. So that gives you this opposite inequality. Gives you equality over here. All right. So there are many proofs of, of this theorem. There's a proof by uh, Kirby. There's a proof by someone I forgot. Generalizing active methods. Um, for the other proof is the model theory. Um, and And the nice thing about this theory is, is you can generalize it to other contexts sort of very easily. Um, so before I do that, I just want to point out that if V1, if, if, if V, we can take V arbitrarily here. So suppose V were a product of varieties, V1 cross V2, where V1 is in C to the N. And V2 is in C star to the N. And now assume that if you explain change V1, you lie inside V2. So if you remember, this is the kind of thing we had to rule out in order to prove the axiom detection. This was the axiom that was taken. Okay? So if this is true, then the dimension of U is at least the dimension of V1. You contain the entire graph of V1 and the exponential map. And so we have the dimension of V1 plus the dimension of V2, which is the dimension of V, is at least, by axial, the dimension of U plus n, which is at least the dimension of v1 plus n. So the dimension of v2 is at least n, which means v2 has to be c to the n. So actually it immediately implies the statement we talked about earlier, the action the Marshall statement. And if you look at sort of what this condition is saying, what you've proven here, in terms of functions, it's exactly what I wrote with the x and the minimum state. That's why I wrote it the way I did. 
So this is what we need. What we need is a land projection case. Um, okay, so yeah, using this formulation, let me see if I can. Okay, let me just erase this blackboard immediately. Yeah, so the nice thing about this formulation, like I said, is it generalizes um, very easily. So if you want to generalize some sort of transcendent statement like this to the J function, for example, instead of the exponential function, um, that's not hard. Instead of F1 for Fn everywhere, you write, instead of E to the F1, E to the Fn, you write J of F1, J of Fn. And the statement generalizes easily. But the proof won't generalize at all, because the differential equation is much more complicated by J. But you can at least make the statement. Um, but if you want to go, if you want to generalize things to higher dimensions, it becomes a little bit less clean to do that. So, x general for arbitrary Shimura varieties. Or actually, even for, if you want, a billion varieties. Just to make the statement. So the trick here, because now we're starting with some covering map phi from H to S, where HS is either like C to the N and A, or A is an abelian variety. Okay. Or it can be sort of um, H is a symmetric space and S is a Shimura variety. Right? So like one case of this, for example, is like the upper half plane to the N and the modular curve to the power of N. And there's a few sort of other cases. You can mix these two together and whatnot. Um, but so whenever you're in this context, you can make a statement like this. So now, what does X general say? So it starts with the same. So you have a variety V inside H cross S which is algebraic. And you let U be a component of V intersect the graph of pi now to make the exact same statement. And I will assume that the projection to H or to S, either one, of U does not lie in the proper weakly special subvariety. OK, so what I mean by these guys, we haven't really talked about it much, but a little. Um, I just mean you rule out the things you have to rule out. So in the GM case, we're exactly really got cosets of few linear subspaces. In the abelian variety case, you're ruling out cosets of abelian subvarieties. In the Shimura case, you have to rule out sort of these sub Shimura varieties that we talked about. So, for example, like in this case, you rule out varieties where either coordinate is constant or two of the coordinates are off by a fixed isogeny. Um, there's some general notion of this kind of thing that you have to rule out. But once you rule out sort of the correct thing, the conclusion is exactly the same. So the dimension of V is equal dimension of u plus n. So if you wanted to make this purely algebraically, this definition, you can sort of do that, but it becomes a bit clumsy, because you have to sort of 
to write this map of the functions, you have to pick coordinate functions for S. You have to fix like enough automorphic functions to describe this map. And there's some choice there, and the arbitrariness of the choice makes things a little unnecessarily messy. Whereas this framework is extremely clean and easier to work with as well. All right. Um, any questions about this? all this stuff? It's a big diversion of the news so far. Um, so the reason that I'm talking about this is that if one wants to go beyond Andrew York into zebra pink territory, um, and next class I think we'll finish by I'll talk a little bit about work with work of Jonathan Peel and Philip Habegger where they do a little bit of that in, in this context. Um, then if one is to follow at least a similar strategy using normality and transcendence that's been used for Andre Ort, you need sort of this stronger um, transcendence ingredient in order to get things started. Okay, um, so I want to finish by giving you guys the lemma that I owe you from last time, which I finally worked out. So we'll get back to all that next time. Okay, so from last time, at some point something was magic. This is the thing that was magic, so let's, let's make it unmagic. So let's say V. Last time we had a variety V in, in the square of the modular curve, which is a curve. And we assumed that pi one V is inside the diagonal SL2V. We actually assumed something a bit weaker. We had some conjugate by some rational thing. You can massage it very quickly into this. So. Let's just deal with this case. Um, then V is just a diagonal x1 inside x1 squared. Okay? So the proof is actually pretty similar to what we did for the linear case. If you recall the linear case, we assumed this kind of thing, and we made a harmonic function, and we sort of said it has some maximum inside there, and so it's constant, and so it's inside the linear subtext. That was sort of the argument we used. We're going to use a very similar thing, only it's a little bit trickier this time. So, yeah, so first of all, let uh, V naught in H squared be a component of the inverse image of V. which is stable under um, the diagonal SO2Z group. The model group is exactly the diagonal SO2Z group. And let D of ZW be the hyperbolic distance. So if you have two points, in H, this measure is a really robotic metric. Okay, so then like the bit of the, sort of, unless you're used to these functions a little bit, the magic step is if you look at this function, it's magic, but it's sort of useful to, it's very generalizable magic, it's useful to know. So if you look at this function, you take a distance and you do some stuff to it, okay n squared, take log. So this function takes values between minus infinity and zero. So this function is plurisubharmonic. subharmonic In fact, on all of h squared. Okay? Which means if I restrict it to any one-dimensional curve, in particular, it be not, I get a PSH function. 
Okay, but D of G W is exactly delta S to Z invariant. It makes delta S to R invariant, because these guys act as uh, automorphisms of the hyperbolic disk. So therefore, F restricted to V naught descends to a plurie subharmonic function on V. This is very much what we're using this step over here. So there's not invariant under all of us to Z cross to Z, it's only invariant under the diagonal subgroup. And so we need to know that V naught just model the diagonal subgroup is actually V, which is precisely this condition over here. Okay, so there's a few ways to finish now. Here's sort of a fast one. Yeah, so once you have a PSH function of the great variety, um, so considering the maximum value of f on v, immediately implies that f is constant. Because it's subharmonic, so the maximum value is smaller than anything on this, and so it's going to be equal, it's going to be constant everywhere. Which means that this distance function is constant on v0. Okay? So, yeah, we're basically done. In the, in the linear case, it was easier because we didn't need a real function. We had a holomorphic function. It's some linear combination of the coordinates. And that was constant, so we were immediately inside something good. Now we're only inside a sort of three-dimensional real thing. It's a little bit more work to conclude. Um, one easy way to conclude is that working in the disk model, v squared, the distance gets more and more stretched out at the boundary. We conclude that v naught intersect the boundary of v squared is exactly z equals w intersect the boundary of v squared. Because the metric is very, very high at the end. So if things are very fixed and far, they look closer and closer. Okay? Okay, but now you look at the function norm z minus w. This is zero on the boundary of the knot, so it must be zero inside by the maximum principle. Okay, so z equals w of the knot, and so that means that the knot's what you want. So this kind of trick is very common, actually. It's it harder and harder to set up when you go higher and higher, but you get some function with some limited invariance, and if you're monodromic, is controlled, you can descend that down, and you can make these sort of global arguments, which are very powerful. Now, I, I suspect you can use this to recover all of the Lina Gray, but I don't know how to do that, so let me not make that clear. Uh, all right, let's meet again on this page.